So the next speaker is uh, Arvind Krishnaswamy. Um, uh, Arvind is very good. Uh, Arvind runs a software company in Bangalore called Devita. They make mobile apps. One of the things they're working on is an app that um, allows you to practice current music through your phone with a group who is real and working with you. But the entire interface is mediated through a phone so that you don't have to listen to it in person. It's an interesting idea. I hope Arvind speaks for that um, when it comes to that. But, uh, Avi's expertise is on both iOS and Android. You know, Levita builds mobile apps around both platforms. And uh, in today's session, he's going to give his comparison and say, let's look at Android from the perspective of where it stands compared to uh, other platforms, not only iOS, which is the other leading platform. Uh, Avi is also the chair of the program committee for DroidCon, which is the Android conference. So, DroidCon is a series of conferences on Android around the world. It started off in Germany. Uh, they are now in the fourth year. Then the London edition is also in the fourth year. This, uh, as of this year, there's an edition in Spain. There's one in uh, Belarus, in the eastern side of Europe. And the Indian edition is the first outside of Europe. So we'll be doing the second edition this year. Uh, last year we had about 500 people. This year we think it will have about 800 people overall. Uh, two days of sessions, three parallel tracks, or everything to the Android. Army and his team manage the schedule for the day. So it's their responsibility to understand what is the profile of the audience that's coming in. You know, um, when you come in as uh, someone who wants to attend a conference, you expect to flow in a logical order. And deciding the logical order is what Abhi does. And so that's uh, his role in the events organizing. So today he's going to be talking about Android in the context of uh, the mobile ecosystem. Thanks, Kiran. Can you guys hear me okay? Well, I live in Bangalore now, I'm actually a Chennai boy. I'm going to be in Gopal, not too far from here. So I'm growing up in the 80s, early 90s here in Bangalore, here in Chennai. Alsa Mall is the hottest place to be. It's a the mall to come to and hang out and to be seen and seen with you know, kids from most of the colleges we have And it's amazing for me coming here to Alsa Mall after almost like 15, 20 years to see that it's still a hotbed, not for startups. I think just the guys who are running the Startup Center, I think you're doing an amazing job. And also with the guys here at HasGeek. Um, see, I moved, I moved back to India about 10 years back from the States. I was working for a few startups there, I helped the startups there, I set up their India office and grew it here. And one of the things I felt 10 years back, right, it was really hard in India to have conversations with tech people, with people in startups, to discuss ideas, to bounce things off and learn. Since 10 years back, most young people just want to go abroad, you know, they want to get on site and think that is the biggest place. But the fact that you guys are here in Chennai on a rainy Saturday afternoon to come here to discuss the jobs and Android is great. So first of all, thank you to all of you. And thank you to the Haskeek guys. They're doing an incredible job just bringing together tech people all over. So uh, in keeping with the uh, Star Wars, Star Trek references, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to be talking today about new mobile frontiers. And um, quickly, I want to ask people here. <laughs> uh, just want to ask you, if you guys could just raise your hands and tell me how many of you have built Android apps here? Excellent, very good. And uh, of you, uh, people who have built iOS apps as well, or mobile apps in general? Excellent, very good. So thank you guys. Um, I'll sort of try to keep this a little interactive. I might sort of call you guys with inputs, feedback as we sort of go along through this. Uh, part of the objective of a session like this is so that you guys know what people are doing out here in the local ecosystem as well. And you know, there's platforms like DroidCon, which is happening in November, where we encourage people here in Chennai as well to come forward and come speak about things that you're doing, to share our learnings. Since what is this sort of community vibrant, right? Is learning from each other within the Indian context here. And to build on our work together and to share it, you know, there's various companies are either doing services or building our own products. And I think we have a lot to learn from each other as we go. So um, some of these maybe things which many of you here are quite familiar with if you're close enough to the mobile world, but I'll cover them more briefly anyway. But first, just a quick question. Can anyone here guess of all the smartphones that sold worldwide in Q1 this year, what percentage of these phones were Android phones? Just a rough percentage. 60, 60, close. I think it was probably. Excellent, Shah. Very good. So let's get close to 55. And um, so what's remarkable about this, right, is you compare the numbers from 2011 up to 2012, 
the Android market share jumped from 36% up to 56 So that's a pretty remarkable leap, right? And, and you can see enough of this on TV, you see ads for Samsung phones and others on TV, right? So the thing, the point I'm trying to make here is you don't even need to be a mobile developer. You know, you, you just can't ignore Android anymore. It's just exploding. It's 56 percent today. This number a year from now, who knows what it could be, right? So it's a platform you can no longer ignore, even if you're building websites. Clearly, enough companies are talking about how mobile first needs to be the strategy. Even if you're building a website, you've got to think about Android first going forward. And um, another little factor here is just operating system versions, right? And so for people who have been around sort of building old desktop apps 10, 15 years back, you're familiar with all the complexities of dealing with different operating system versions and the complexity that brings. And a lot of that's there in Android too. And uh, if you look at these percentages, right, these are the, uh, so you guys are probably familiar with Android versions are sort of alphabetically named. So you, know, you have gingerbread, honeycomb, ice cream, jelly bean. This is sort of the order in which Google names them. And the point that I'm trying to make here is gingerbread, which is now a couple of years old, is still more than half of the Android, Android operating system. There's a number of reasons this is the case. Part of it is the OEMs when shipping out updates to the older phones. Uh, a bunch of little problems around that. But the complexity this brings in, right, is for an Android developer, you sort of need to think about it and say, you know what, should I be targeting the old phones out there, right, and have to have things work in compatibility mode and either progressively degrade, you know, functionality that you make available based on device capabilities, or should you try to target some of the newer phones? And Ice Cream Sandwich, which was released late last year, is still only about a quarter of the total number of Android OS out there. So while this number is increasing, right, if you compare this with iOS, as an example, most Apple <coughs> users upgrade to the latest OS within a month or two of it being available. So 80% of iOS users are on the latest version of iOS. Now, Android developers, we just don't have the budget, right? We've still got target the older versions. Uh, here's another chart which sort of throws, shows a trending line over the last several months uh, since uh, Ice Cream Sandwich started up here on a lot of the newer phones and since Jelly Bean came out, that you can start to see more and more people are getting onto 4.0. But there's still a huge chunk that's on 2.0. Uh, one of caveat is this slide represents percentages. It's not absolute numbers, right? So in reality, right, I mean, these numbers probably haven't changed a lot. Because of Android 2.0 phones, they're probably still on Android 2.0 and haven't got upgraded. It's just that the total numbers of 4.0 and 2.0 are probably in the rights. Um, now, similar to all the issues we face with different browser versions that we spoke about earlier today's meeting, a lot of those complex complexities continue to exist on Android 2. And, um, just to, you know, these weren't enough. There's also complexities around size and density. And um, so the first one is with respect to the phone sizes itself, it's physical size. Okay. And Google classifies these into small, normal, large, and extra large. Okay. So the small phones are uh, like LG Optimus, yeah. or uh, 240 size phones. Uh, the normal size phones would be kind of closer to your 3.2 inch size phones. And then we have the larger size phones, which would be like the Galaxy Note and others that you see. People holding it, but it's more like a larger brick, but you know, it's not larger. And then you've got the extra large phone, which are close to the tablet class, if you will. And uh, in addition to size, you've got density to worry about. Right? Uh, since iOS, Apple came out with their Antenna phones, uh, increasingly more and more than Android manufacturers, are going into the XHDPI category, coming out with really high pixel density. So you could have a phone that's you know just two to three inches in size in the future, but its resolution could be 2,000 by 1,000 in the future. And you need to deal with it. You need to plan for all the pixels. Your artwork you need to be ready for that. So increasingly, right, these things are shifting. There's clearly a trend towards XHDPI. You'll we'll start to see more and more of XHDPI in the future. Whether the start to see more of large versus small versus normal is still not totally clear. It's clear that I think in last year, Android tablets didn't do that, right? Motorola Zoom came out and it was a disaster. The Galaxy tab was okay, right? Until Apple started to sue them. And then um, 
uh, but just for the summer. So the Nexus 7 has come out and it's got a fantastic price point. It's pretty clear that the tablet space is going to change quite a bit in Android. So I think we can start to expect a lot more growth with the extra large side of the space. Um, so one of the things I want to convey here is, you know, I often hear Android developers talk about fragmentation and how it causes so much pain. The thing is, you know, we've got to stop complaining about it. Android is about fragmentation. And fragmentation is sort of the second side of the coin, which is a beautiful diversity that Android offers. The fact that we have the power of choice to be able to choose from a whole wide variety of forms of different sizes, and you can pick and choose what you like. It's the beauty of the diversity and the freedom that Google gives you. And fragmentation isn't going away. It's something we need to plan for, figure out what the best practices are to deal with it, and how to approach it based on targeting maybe certain phone sizes or certain phone resolutions and then taking a certain approach to the um, Now, here's just another quick data point, right, which is just data from uh, the uh, Open Signal Match app. So what Open Signal Match did is they took data from all their users and put it together in an infographic, which shows you what percentage of the users use devices from each of the hardware vendors. And as you can see, Samsung's a clear winner, right? I mean, there's more than half the phones out there today in the Android world which are all Samsung. Um, much further behind come in HTC, uh, SEMC here is Sony Ericsson, and then there's Motorola. Now, there's a whole bunch of other Android manufacturers out there from all around the world, from China, from India, and so on, but they're a much smaller percentage. The clear leader with respect to profits is Samsung. These other days are much, much further behind. Now, how does this matter to you as an app developer? I think when you're trying to make those choices with respect to which devices you want to test out your app on, you can easily pick Samsung, because both of users have. Now, why does it matter when you just have to test with stock, vanilla ROMs? Now, obviously, each OEM's ROMs on top of it adds little nuances, the keyboard behaviors could be different, little things that you need to work with, you need to play with, right? But having a sense of what this distribution is lets you plan and approach how you want to tackle those fragmentation problems. Since you have an idea of what your target user base is like, which devices they're using, and you can make some choices. Like pick uh, likely a couple of Samsung devices, and then sort of choose to be an HTC, Sony Ericsson, Motorola, depending on what you're making. And once you've got that 80 percent case covered, right, you can kind of go from there once you get to some critical mass with respect to your user base. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is monetization. And uh, I sort of want to make this a little interactive. I'd love to hear you guys sort of talk about your apps, um, what your approach to monetization has been, and any challenges you've had along the way. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share just general insights, things that I've heard, my experience, things that I've heard from people. I'd love to get your thoughts too on it. So first, iOS, right? Two-thirds of Android users don't actually pay for apps. Uh, there's been enough documentation around it. We've done a number of surveys. In general, most of the Android users prefer free apps. I think most users prefer free apps. And that's not a joke. That's not a lie about it. But I think there's a bit more of a tendency in the Android world to sort of go with a free app versus thinking about going with a paid app. So the challenge this poses for a developer is how do you monetize this, right? And there's ultimately just a small set of monetization models you can go with a mobile platform. Unless you've got a service that you're running which expands out to the web and other platforms that you could monetize as well. So um, paid apps, outright paid apps, doesn't really appear to be a good monetization model going forward. Right? There's only so far you could go with it. You could look at advertising based models, right? But from everyone I've spoken to in general, CPMs are highest for the iPad. They're sort of a lot lower for the iPhone. And then Android is a little further behind. Uh, CPM will probably be a little higher if you've got an app that has a medium, right? Uh, it's not less if it's tied to apps and things like that. So um, while it's a model, and especially with Android, the argument would be here, you've got much more scale that you can get up and just to the number of Android end users is higher, right? And if you're building an app for India, right? Uh, much more Android users in India than iPhone users. And that number is just really growing, given that Apple's pricing video is ridiculous. So that number is only going to go up, and uh, I think just in terms of sheer numbers, India and China have a lot of opportunity there. Right? Just number of users, ad-based models that you could look at. Um, so I just want to quickly pause. 
any of you here who built out Android apps? If you have any stories you want to share, monetization model. If you met it now, or no, that's fine. I'd love to hear from you guys. You want to let me know offline if you have any feedback, things that you guys are doing. Um, I think the font here is a little small, so I'll just quickly read this piece out. This is about in-app purchase. So you guys are familiar with in-app purchase, right? Within the app, you can have a free app, but there's certain things you can buy within the app. So sort of people get to try the app, and then certain modules, like for instance, if it's a game, you could unlock a certain level of paying more. Or if you're buying an app that has music, the app itself could be free with some tracks free, and then you could buy additional music tracks. So in that purchase, right, clearly over the last couple of years has become the more popular model through which you know, if an app isn't free or ad driven, you can monetize it either by telling people you know, you, 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 you know, you turn off ads if you pay so much, or unlock or subscribe to additional things by paying so much. Now with this, right, some stats have shown that 22% of the people, if they like an app right in the first session, they go ahead and make it an app purchase. So that's about 22% of people. But 33% of them go through between two to nine sessions with the app before they actually are ready to purchase it. And 44% of people use the app at least 10 times before they're willing to pay to buy anything. So the thing is, user engagement is important, right? Two, three years back in the mobile space, you could build you know, a little, it could be a Far app, and things are funny, and you get away with people spend a buck or two on it just for the sheer entertainment factor. Those days are over, right? So now we're in 2012, and users are looking for something that is providing them sustained value in some way. People are a lot more discerning, a lot more of the apps that are not popular out there are free. So if you're coming up with an app that's new, that's different, it still needs to resonate with the user. So driving just, you know, average number of daily users, monthly users is a big deal. The same sort of tracking you would do with websites starts to become just as relevant. And apps no longer are standalone. The way a lot of app developers a couple of years back would just build out an app, put it out there, and try to monetize it. And that ecosystem is just changing for um, Now, um, no, with respect to monetization, just give me a second here, I think you disconnected. native versus HTML5 debate. I think uh, uh, there's a lot that's talked about it. If you guys are probably familiar with it. Uh, I just want to share some of my experiences, some thoughts that I've had. I want to get your thoughts too. Feel free to speak up if you'd like to share things that you guys have done. So clearly, right, I mean, when mobile apps started to get popular, people were drawing analogies to the days of the desktop apps back in the early 90s, saying, you know what, this is just a fad. People are going to build these apps for a year or two and then it's done, we move back to the web. And let's just step back to see how this whole mobile app thing happened. So back in 2007, right, when Apple launched the iPhone, initially they did not offer an SDK for native apps. Initially all they offered was the web SDK. So people could build web-based apps. And they really were pushing HTML5, they were a key part of building out web kit and everything else. Okay. So, but there's a huge approach from developers at that time who said, you know what, no, it's not going to happen over the web, it's difficult, network connections are slow, we want a native SDK. And then six months after the iPhone was launched, Apple responded by providing a native SDK. And the unusual thing that happened is two things happened. One, the iPhone just took off, more than anyone expected it to. And people started building apps that were selling like crazy, right? So the whole native ecosystem just boomed. Now, since then, one, the networks have gotten a whole lot better with things like LTE, 4G, all over the place. Two, HTML5 and CSS3. The types of things people are doing today is, I think just uh, some of the folks just demonstrated even before this session, are increasingly completely changing this, uh, the need to build native apps. So, where earlier people had looked at things like Flash, to build out apps that will be responsive and will work in a consistent way across different browsers and different operating systems. More and more of that is now happening with HTML5. Now, however, you know, this is sort of one of those questions people often ask me. I mean, does it mean that a couple of years down the road we'll never need native apps? And it's always hard to say, right? It's like one of those questions of when the TV came out, 
would people stop listening to radio? Right? We still listen to radio, we still watch TV, we've got a whole bunch of different news sources. So some of these things might exist and they may be relevant in certain scenarios. And I just wanted to talk through some of those, since I think the area where we use one versus other as things stand, and the thought process behind it is quite significant. So, um, in my experience, it makes sense in choosing a native approach. And just to be clear, when I say native versus HTML5, it doesn't mean exclusively one versus other. You could be using both in conjunction, using a build. Right? You might choose to build out a native app and a container shell, with some pieces being built with your native modules and some pieces using a web view, embedding web pages in it, either local web pages or a remote web page using HTML5 manifest file or that sort of approach. Right? Now, um, to me, the native approach especially makes a lot of sense if you are looking to tap into a lot of inherent device capabilities. Doing things like if you've got an app that's an augmented reality app, obviously it makes the most sense to do it completely native. If you're trying to tap into device capabilities, it would be a lot slower and in some cases just not feasible at all to do well in browser. Uh, second, now the nature of mobile devices, right? is we tend to use it sparingly. Like if you're in the elevator, you just quickly open up Facebook, check your status, you turn it off, you go back. So the attention span of those users is really small. People tend to use these mobile apps for a minute or two in between and don't often use it on a sustained basis. Versus when you're back in your desktop or laptop, you use Facebook for you know, 10, 15 minutes, maybe more, to some you. But uh, what I'm trying to say is the need for having a design that's responsive so the user can quickly open the app, go back to where it was before, you know, pretty much where they left it, uh, when they uh, stopped using the app earlier. And uh, building it in such a way those interactions are quick is a big deal. Right? So the challenge most mobile app developers have had is, in building these out with web views, which should apply, at times it's responsive as it wasn't there, and users will get straight. Now while some of it is changing, right, I think it's still, a good idea to think about areas within your app where the user might spend 80% of time, right? And see if you want to go native with those, especially around navigation. Because especially around navigation, user's frustration can be if he doesn't feel like the UI is responsive. So your overall navigation scheme and some of the key buttons within the app and things where the revision indicator is often, I feel, it's useful to stick to keeping these pieces in there. Uh, the third piece is, you know, ultimately, you know, people refer to this whole native experience. And um, there's a number of libraries out there. I think one of the earlier speakers referenced Fogap and uh, Titanium's Absolutator, there's Kirin, there's a bunch of other libraries, platforms, SDKs out there. They try to offer you a silver bullet that says, use these, and you can have a common code base, leverages across different platforms, and focus on uh, just certain code areas of business logic that you need to build out. And uh, these, all of these have their merits. And especially, I think, in the enterprise app space, I think they have a lot of value. Since I think they fit the pattern of enterprise apps quite a bit. Where I think just the UI patterns are a little more simpler, and I think it fits uh, uh, better. Uh, but with some of the consumer apps, right, when people look at uh, like an on off control or a slider, they expect the same experience that they have from Google's apps or from Apple's apps. And if you come up with a UI paradigm in your app which doesn't sort of mimic them, in other words, you're trying to build a web-based app which looks like a native app, you're probably okay because the user expectations aren't the same. But if you try to mimic it and the user sees that, you know what, what you're building doesn't feel native, the user's trying to get a little frustrated. So I think that's another decision point that I think is often relevant. Um, now, where do you sort of need to achieve with that? I think one is, it's a speed of development, right? Uh, I think as one of the other speakers said, increasingly I think today web skills are commoditized. Um, while building good web apps is still hard and requires uh, people with deeper skills, it is easier to get developers up to speed in building apps with HTML5 and JavaScript and less in CSS versus object C. And no matter what you say, I mean, Objective-C, there's a functional language, is, is, is probably a more functional in nature than JavaScript, it's based on small talk and everything else, but it still is a bit archaic in some of the notions that it uses, and the metaphors it uses, and going out and building software with Objective-C and exporters are, right? 
Uh, although Apple's done a good job of taking memory management out of the equation, it's still is difficult. Likewise, in Android, right, uh, building on some of these apps with Java can feel a little, you, you know, you can sort of feel that you've got so much boilerplate to do something where you can do it by the web, man, that would be so much easier, right? And in some of these cases, just the speed of being able to build this via the web and HTML5 is great, right? And you've got two choices for the web, right? Either you can have these HTML5 pages built and embedded within the app, or you can have it delivered remotely. You could prefetch the pages, you could cache some of the pages, have a remote web page, load local resources, with a whole bunch of clips you could have. And both Google and Apple offer a native to web bridge through which you can share objects between Java and the JavaScript, or between Objective C and uh, the JavaScript in case of iOS as well. And uh, ultimately, right, while mobile app companies sort of need to work in an engineering cycle, you know, I've got a month long sprint cycle, and I go through a build it up and release it, most web companies are used to much shorter cycles, right? You probably do a one week cycle and might do even two releases in a week. Right? That's sort of how Facebook works in the other four six computers. And with HTML5, you have an opportunity to iterate a lot more. So you can release early, you can release often, and go through the cycles a lot more. And um, there's just certain things that I think the web just does much better than native, both on iOS and Android. And especially when it's fluid layouts involved, you're trying to mix text and images, it's just so much more work to do it natively on either iOS or Android. While these things are just so much more natural on the web. And those challenges of dealing with, for instance, different device sizes and, and layouts, uh, even with the fragments that Google has provided since the last uh, SDK release, it still puts a lot of onus on the developer. Whereas doing these things with CSS, like media queries, simplifies various aspects of those problems. Um, so I think, you know, to me, I think the bottom line really is it's not one size fits all. I don't think you can kind of make a decision and say, you know what, the shaper is best or native is best. I think we've got to look at the use cases of the app you're trying to build. You need to look at it and say, you know what, there are some portions where all you're doing is we're rendering things, it's only a display. There's no user interaction. If there's no user interaction, I think it's a great candidate for a shape of time. If there's areas of users interacting with it a lot, I think that's a good case to look at it. And the other piece of it is just your internal processes and how you're approaching it. Think about, do you want to iterate a lot, or is it something where you focus on a longer cycle? Um, so I think it's, it's not one size fits all. I think it's a mix of both, and I don't think either, I don't think native apps are going to be soon. But I think it's a clear indication that the trend is to the shooter side with all of these. It makes more sense to invest your engineering resources there and try to build it native when it makes most sense. So user feels at home on the mobile platform that he's used to. Like if I'm an Android user, I like to have to feel like an Android app, and not like a web page. If I'm an iOS user, I like to app feel like an iOS app, and I like to feel at home in the ecosystem in which I'm in. So um, I can keep going on with the uh, Saturday theme, going where no drawing has gone before. Uh, the types of things people are doing. With, oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but you know, in keeping with the theme, right? Um, Today, Android is being used in places that we would never have imagined before. People are using it in robots, people are using it, using it in televisions, people are using it in uh, fridges. Uh, there's an app which Yahoo recently came out with, actually, I quite another company which built this, where you can just set up your phone via the computer by the side of the TV and uh, turn on the TV and start to watch your favorite channel. And the app will visit, similar to some of the Shazam. And it'll figure out which TV channel you're watching, which TV show you're watching, and give you information about the TV show, the characters, and so on. So, the types of things people are doing with Android today are just amazing. It's being used in a number of different areas, and um, I think the sort of opportunities we have to innovate to this ecosystem is just more and more. Uh, one of my friends is working with a, a startup in Bangalore where they're trying to come up with tablets in the education space for teachers and for children. And they're trying to source a low-cost Android tablet from a Chinese manufacturer who's willing to give them a great tablet for roughly about 2,000 or 3,000 rupees. 
And I don't mean a cheap tablet, I mean a good responsive tablet with a good screen and everything else. So the fact is, the device, the hardware piece of it is so commoditized, you can get really cheap hardware, and if you can build good software on top of Android, the potential and the things you can do with it is huge. Okay. Smart homes, right? You can imagine Android running in your fridge, in your poster, right? In your electricity meter, so that you know exactly how the electricity usage you use versus all the other neighbors in your apartment and everyone else in India. You can compare it, right? But the potential is just huge, it's mind boggling. And um, uh, a lot of these demos have actually been coming together at DroidCon. So last year at DroidCon, one of the engineers demoed a robot on stage. Uh, running out, you know. So um, this year is likely, I think, where there's one uh, session proposal which is coming on the has been funded for DroidCon, where someone's looking to show Kinect running with an Android app. So some pretty interesting app demos that we have lined up for DroidCon, so that's my shameless plug for DroidCon as well. So you guys should look up the DroidCon site and see what's coming up. Um, I thought I'd give you guys just some trivia. Suicide after a lot of persecution in Britain back then. And he ate a cyanide based apple. And one bite off the apple. And there's a bit of urban legend about that influencing the apple logo with a device. Good. Thanks, Ashwin. So, um, I don't really have anything else. I think, you know, the mobile space is just changing so much. It's hard to predict where things will go. I think it's incredibly exciting. I uh, welcome all of you to DroidCon and those of you who are a part of the mobile ecosystem here to come forward with talks and sessions. I think it's a great opportunity to share what people are doing and develop with each other. And, um, you know, um, I think in the next one year we'll see a lot of new things in the space with the Windows Phone coming out. Uh, the new updates that are coming out later this year should, I think, open it, open it out potentially. Uh, proved to be a challenge to Android as well. So I think we need to wait and see, but I think it's an exciting year. So, uh, stay in your seats. There's a great talk by ISEM coming up right after this. 